Hey guys, it's Sean. How's it going today? Want to share with you an interview that I had that was such a treat with Nancy Bell Anderson and we discussed her book and museum at the Napkin Cove Heritage Center. So we discussed this book, The Columbia Rivers Ellis Island. This is about the last remaining quarantine station in the United States. Well, one that's in good repair uh, in the United States. And so we go through uh, with Nancy the story of the Heritage Center, how they discovered it, how they turned it into a museum. Um, and then we also talk more about the quarantine station itself, life of officers at the time in the area. This is taking place in Astoria, uh, Oregon, and uh, uh, Napton Cove in Washington, so at the mouth of the Columbia River on the West Coast. So we talk about life there, what the inspection process was like for the officers, um, some of the boats that they used. We talk about the Surgeon General at the time, Walter Wyman, a little bit. And then towards the end, we talk about the future of this heritage site and the hopes to preserve it. So uh, please visit naptoncoveheritage.org. Uh, I believe that's correct, but I'm definitely going to have the, the links below uh, wherever you're watching this. Uh, so please enjoy this. Uh, again, the first part, we're really talking about the history of the museum, how it came to be. And then the last part, we, we focus a little bit more on the public health service and the quarantine, quarantine station uh, itself. So uh, please check out this interview and visit the website, uh, buy the book if you're interested in learning more about it. It's pretty quick and easy read, uh, so you can finish this easily in an evening. And so um, please enjoy my interview with Nancy Bell Anderson. It takes me a while to figure this out. Good. <laughs> oh, same here. I'm like figuring out the audio and everything. So this is the new world that we're in. Yes. Well, and we old folks are trying really hard to adjust to that. <laughs> <laughs> what would we do without you young people? <laughs> you sound like my grandma. <laughs> Probably about her age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, thanks for uh, joining. Are you... Um... Are you in Washington then right now, or where do you live? Well, no, I actually live across the river. I live in Oregon. Okay. Uh, the heritage site is right across from Astoria. Uh, this whole area is kind of the the estuary of the, where the Columbia goes into the ocean. So okay. we're kind of by state. Okay. And the reason really for that um, quarantine station being built in, um, Washington is that there were, Astoria had a higher population and I think the word was that the kind of bad case of NIMBY, they really yeah. wanted to have a quarantine station. And out in my backyard. Let's buy that old cannery across the river, get them yeah. over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, um, yeah, no, uh, uh, that makes sense that that you live there and yeah I, I noticed the not my backyard in, in your book that that made me yeah. laugh because it, it seems to happen <laughs> with a lot of things that, um when it and I was thinking I live here in Albuquerque New Mexico and um it made me think of homeless shelters and sometimes people want that solution but then it's like oh yeah we not want here. it just not here <laughs> so that made so, me laugh that's what I was going to ask you you're in New Mexico yes ma'am well yeah. how about that <laughs> yeah so yeah, I, um, I'm originally from Minnesota. I came down here with the public health service. I now live yeah. in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I met my wife here. Um, and then I separated from the public health service uh, about one year ago, actually. Um, so that's kind of what brought me to the Southwest. Well, now, isn't that where uh, the new uh, secretary of the Department of the Interior, isn't she? Yeah, Deb Holland, yes. Yeah, how about, wow, I, that's impressive. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah and so. Why, okay, why did you quit? <laughs> well, I, um, it was multifactorial. I, you know, I was living um, apart from my wife. We were living, mm -hmm. doing long distance for a year. I mean, we were a four hour drive away, not too bad, but um, so that was a challenge. I was kind of getting burnt out with pharmacy, honestly. Um, with what I was doing. And then um, I just felt like I wasn't having the impact that I wanted with the public health service. I thought I was gonna, it was gonna be my career. I was, um, you know, 
very adamant about the public health service and the value, um, and which is why I still am connected to it. And I, you know, I love the history and the story, like so many yeah. officers do. Um, but just felt like it wasn't looking down the road and the path. Uh, it wasn't going to um, lead to what I was hoping to do anymore. So I just so are that you a, are you a pharmacist? Yes. Yes. Ah. yes. I went to a college that was big on pharmacy, Oregon State. Lots oh, yeah. of I, a lot of those guys I knew and gals. Yeah. 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 They have a good pharmacy school up there. So. Yeah. So, Nancy, I was hoping to um, record our conversation today, if that was OK with you, um, to share with uh, my audience of essentially officers that follow uh, PHS Proud. Um, and yeah. I wanted to just like ask if that was okay if I recorded our conversation. Absolutely, because one of our goals is to strengthen our ties with public health service, especially retirees that might be interested in the history. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And when I came across your website, um, you know, I was like, oh, wow, like this is what we love. Like, you know, these are the things that people like to see and hear about and, and, and try to understand, I think, the history and where we've come from. So, um, I think people will really like this um, if they haven't heard of it already. So, well, yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of obscure, <laughs> not by choice. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe that's um, where we can start. Um, why don't you just kind of, you know, yeah. tell me a little bit about your life and background and how you came to be the director of the Napton Cove um, Heritage <laughs> Center? Well, it really started in 1950. The General Services Administration um, had property for auction down in this uh, neck of the woods. And um, my, my folks purchased that. My dad was a teacher uh, in Portland, Oregon, which is close to us, 80 miles. Okay. Uh, and we were, he was an avid fisherman. We came down here and fished all the time anyway. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, teachers at that time, uh, and still probably seek summer employment because their salaries were a little lacking. Yep. And he looked at that facility. I, I have a picture of it behind me. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. my, just, anyway, that um, looked to him to be a really good spot to have a sport fishing camp. Mm -hmm. um, that He was very entrepreneurial. And that was that was repurposing before it was called repurposing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, that's why he purchased it. Um, he wasn't particularly interested in the history, sure. but fortunately, my mother, my mother was. So <clears throat> she, she kind of started to delve into old books she'd find and artifacts that would turn up. And um, she was the one that discovered that the building, that uh, the, the large building that we now house houses our sort of museum um, was called a lazaretto and she pursued that and found out that of course that is a pest house hmm. so from the time from 1950 on i spent a lot of time in a pest house <laughs> every summer <laughs> um, but that kind of opened our eyes you know mother especially was aware of all of that <clears throat> uh, my my parents eventually um, retired down there in 1980 it was placed on the national register of historic places mm -hmm. and that kind of made my mom and i perk up a little well that's that's not so easy to get on yeah. and it was the pacific county historical site it wasn't us that did it but they thought they approached my folks and said would you mind of course not mm -hmm. um now, my, my folks actually ended up retiring down there. Uh, by that time, the fishing, sport fishing industry had changed a little. And during that time, also, the good old Army Corps of Engineers decided to come through and put a highway right through the front of our property. Mm. It was a kind of a, <clears throat> a sad day for us. Um, yep. It kind of closed off the uh, tidelands, which are part of the, you can see them behind me, I think, where that fumigation building was. And yeah. today there is a highway down there now where you see the river. Um, but um, we dealt with that okay. Uh, first, in some ways, my folks were getting elderly <clears throat> and made better access for them. Uh, I was no longer quite so isolated. So that's how it became part of our family. And uh, after, uh, I guess in 1995, our daughter and I decided that 
this was really something we should try to do something with. And uh, we felt a little bit obligated since it had gone on the National Register. Yeah. She and I decided, we'll just, she decided this really, we will call this the Napton Cove Heritage Center. We just made that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're still using that today for lack of a better word, I guess. But anyway, um, that kind of started our interest in delving into the real history of this place. And of course, we learned so much about the good old Marine Hospital Service, how it began in 1798 and um, progressed to become finally in 1912, the Public Health Service, preceded by what they called the Marine Hospital Service. Yep. And all this interesting maritime history, which included um, at the mouth of the Columbia, uh, I, there was a whole lot of commerce. Uh, not so much immigration as, as commerce. Um, Ellis Island really uh, focuses on um, European immigrants and Angel Island on Asian immigrants. Yep. Um, ours was um, because of the exploiting of, the, um, of nature around us, um, yep. huge lumber industry yep. and canning salmon. The canned yeah. salmon just was king. <laughs> yeah, and that and was so, the the lumber was the, was at the Napton Mill that you yes, described. Yes, because I like in your book how you 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 kind of you start way back. I mean, starting with Lewis and Clark yeah. and kind of the history of things that took place in that region. And you talk about Lewis and Clark passing through there, and then how right. it was a a cannery with, and mm -hmm. you know some of the interesting history you talk about with the Chinese workers there, and it's you know kind of sad with just how they were treated. Um, and then it converted to that Napton uh, mill and well, then to eventually exactly. the quarantine station. And I, I think that's where we differ from both Angel Island and Ellis Island because those places were selected because they were isolated. Uh, this particular site uh, has a long history. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's located on a, a, a cove off of the Columbia River and it, a, sort of a protected cove. And it also has a natural uh, channel. They call it the blind channel because it ends just uh, east of where the quarantine station is. But way back in the 1800s, 1700s, that's where ships came in. They came on the Washington side. Astoria doesn't like to let you know that. <laughs> yeah. Because now the main channel is on the, uh, is dredged and it's on the other side. And of course it had to be dredged to be much deeper, but all that early traffic um, came in that way. So that's why we have this progression layers of history, which mm. ultimately all of that opening up of the West and all of that led to um, the necessity for controlling infectious disease. Yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, saying was, and you probably read, the, you, I'm impressed you read my book. I can't believe that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you ever find it? <laughs> I just, yeah, I, I still, I was, um, I'm a history buff. I write, I love, I'm stumbling across things. There's stuff in New Mexico that I've written about as far as diff different forts. In fact, side and note, there's a officer that that's on your website that was stationed at Fort Stanton in Lincoln County here. Oh, um, interesting. And I've, I've been to Fort Bayard, which is a different city down in, by Silver City. Uh, and I've been meaning to go to Fort Stanton to look at that because um, I, I want to know that history. It's been closed due to COVID, but um, so yeah, no, I I I gobble this stuff up. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, we need more young people like you. Good for you. Well, that and, and Nancy, that, I'm curious. Just you mentioned before you and your daughter. You know, you started about 1995. You you wanted to turn this into something, and I'm just curious when you heard about. The public health service and the marine hospital service what did had you heard about it before or what did those things oh mean? well yeah I, yeah I, my mother you know we started delving into the history of it and of course there are artifacts left at the station station closed in 1938 and it was dormant for until dad bought it in 1950 but there was a lot of stuff there old bottles with emblems on them and we'd look at that and say, I wonder what USMHS means. Hmm. And then we'd find pottery shards um, uh, down in the, the, we still own the seven acres of tide land, even though there's a highway and highway took out an acre at the front of the property, but yep. uh, surfaces all the time uh, indicating those different layers of history. And um, 
I just began to be really interested in the, the history of that station and the reason for it being chosen to put to be put on the register. Yep. And ultimately what we have discovered because uh, we have we have two public health service retirees on our board. Uh, one is a nurse and one is a, a doctor and uh, Jay Paulson uh, did a whole bunch of research and um, we, we still have a lot of research that some people are really interested on our board that are going through it. And we're trying to uh, get a list of all the ships. It's almost completed now that, that actually entered through the port of Astoria. Um, so we, it's a little hard to define the difference between crew members and if anybody was immigrating. Mostly we have dis discerned that there were huge crews coming into these. They were um, coming from all over the world because of all this commerce going on. Um, but the, um, uh, by 2005, we had discovered that we decided, we had decided, my daughter and I, that the most interesting building on the premises that existed, and I think that dock building you see behind me there, that unfortunately went in the drink through the years. That today is a piling field. Uh, my dad, when it began to collapse, his, his little fishing industry, his sport camp had deter, you know, tapered off. Mm -hmm. The highway came through, people went further west to do their fishing. Um, so he salvaged what he could off that before it totally went in the drink. So there's, we have a lovely piling field out there and um, that is the building that you see there that used to be the fumigation center. But the, the building, I don't know if you can see it at the top there. I don't know, it's- In the, to the that, left or the center one. Yeah, I see that, that. yep. That, that's the building that we thought was the most significant um, to highlight. And as we found due to Jay Paulson and his research, it is indeed the last U.S. PHS um, Lazaretto that remains in the United States. Uh, Angel Island had one on, on an offshore island that's in terrible disrepair and is cordoned off for the public. Uh, Ellis, that was Ellis Island. Did I say Angel Island? Angel Island burned theirs. And so, so many of the stations, and there were almost 40 of these ports of entry, had pest houses, but lots of times they just fell apart or developments came in or they burned them because they thought there might be something. Yeah, I would imagine it's kind of an ick factor. They're like, well, you know, there's people being fumigated and carrying disease. Exactly. So, so let's just burn it down. I, I can see that. Uh, and that was kind of the thing to do, but I guess they just abandoned this one really. And uh, I can attest to the fact, having spent a lot of my life in that building, I don't think I picked up anything. Yeah, <laughs> you're still here, so. <laughs> I have a hearing problem and vision, but other than that, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty pest free. <laughs> and uh, that's been a few years ago. So yeah. anyway, uh, we, that made us really think we really needed to work hard to preserve the history and that building is our best artifact. Mm -hmm. um, it is, uh, it has isolation wards. It's kind of a funny building that's divided into two parts with two large wards and two isolation wards on each end of the building with five exterior porches. So if there's ever a fire, we're not going to have any problem. There's a door practically <laughs> right where you are. You can yeah. exit. <laughs> um, it's, it's just the whole interesting layout of how, um, and how they tra treated infectious disease. It's not a large hospital. It is called a quarantine hospital designated as a lazaretto. Yeah. Um, both Angel Island and Ellis Island are restoring their hospitals, which are much larger. Uh, but they're not the they're not a pest house. Um, we have to be yep. really sure people understand we've got the only one. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good. <laughs> and I, I, no, I, I agree. And, and I think um, that's a good distinction that I came across too, because I'm like, okay, so th this was the hospital, but it's not. It wasn't a, a marine hospital. It's no. a it's a quarantine station, which was kind of a separate arm of the public health service at the time. They had the marine hospital system. And then the quarantine stations were yeah. other little kind of yeah. aspects of the public health service at that time. 
Yeah, the the marine hospitals came out of the, the first act when it was established by Congress that we needed to take care of our mariners and the merchant. Yep. Those were for merchant marines. And that had been phased out really not not too long after the Civil War. It was they were kind of yep. um, phased out apart and yeah. Yeah. And uh, in fact, you probably know this, that the public health service which was the Marine Hospital Service designated that, went through a kind of a tumultuous time, um, uh, some corruption, um, Ill, you know, somebody said you could build a Marine Hospital if you could find a puddle big enough to put it on and, you know, a whole yeah. bunch of that was going on. And, uh, and then finally it was, um, the government straightened it up, cleaned it all up. Yep. <laughs> and, these uh, uh, actual ports of entry had better facilities. Yeah, and that was the birth of of the Surgeon General because they were yeah. they were saying, "Hey, we we're having all these hospitals pop up, and people are, like you said, using it as an excuse yeah. to just make us create a settlement in the West." Um, yeah. And so they they um, the first Surgeon General, the supervising Surgeon John Maynard Woodworth, was set to clean right. it up and 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 uh, make it more of a legit uh entity the, the marine hospitals yeah are you familiar with the book called plagues and politics oh yeah 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 because there's a lot of that a lot of that history in there and anybody from the public health service should read that book it's very well done and i certainly yeah. got a lot of information from from that publication absolutely um we i when i went to officer basic course obc um they gave that book to everybody um i don't I don't know when they started doing that, but I still, um, so I, I hope people are, are getting that book um, for that history. Yeah, it really, it, it was very well researched and, and lots of good information in there, but yep. back to our little um, deal here, uh, let's see, yep. um, to our pest house. Yeah. Uh, we, we formed a nonprofit in 2005 because the roof was needing to breed be redone and the expense of that was not something we were able to handle yeah. and uh, the light dawned and we said oh here's a thought <laughs> maybe we should try to make this a nonprofit," which we succeeded in doing boy that process is something else i don't ever want to go through that again but anyway yeah. <laughs> uh and and of course the fact that we're privately owned complicates things a little bit also but we do indeed, we are a private nonprofit, a 501c3. So uh, that enabled us to get, to seek um, additional funding, um, frank grant money and donations. So we were able to get the roof redone and then we looked at the porches are falling apart and the yeah. build, I had, I had some friends who are in preserva historic preservation come look at it because okay. honestly, I thought, should I board this place up and forget it, or is it worth saving? And they determined that the building itself was in pretty good shape and that it was worth restoring. So, or not, well, yeah, I guess restoring. Anyway, um, the foundation was going bad. Um, there had been clear cut logging on the hill behind us and the land had dropped oh, so many inches into feet. And that the east end of the building was in major, it was kind of slanting. So that was a huge project. It was $32,000. And, you know, if we hadn't had um, the ability to seek grants um, and accept donations, that building would be laying in a heap. <laughs> yeah. And so you also that, mentioned, too, if I remember correctly, you had, um, which telling your story again, I, I appreciated um, the story aspect. Um, and, you know, you, you said your dad was an entrepreneur, and it sounded like yeah. you, if I remember correctly, you you had started to realize you're going to make this into a museum, and then started to reach out to to schools to try to get people to come by for field trips, and mm -hmm. then also the clothespin project, right? Well, yes, interesting. You would bring that up. Yes, we called it. My daughter and I. This is so bizarre. We just love making little clothespin dolls from the old-fashioned clothespins. And um, my background is elementary education. I was an elementary teacher. And, you know, you're always looking for projects that you can make history interesting to kids. Yeah. Well, because I am a doll lover and I just love making those little guys, uh, I started making, um, and with my, and my daughter joined me. She is also 
infected by the clothespin infection. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, uh, we just love telling his history yeah. by peopling it with little people that might have been there. And of course, what better than um, a place of immigration and great commerce from all over the world? Well, hello, there is no end of the clothespin people that you can make. <laughs> And I sold designs, which is, I know, hard to believe, <laughs> but people actually bought them. Um, I sold designs to magazines, and I wrote craft books for kids. And the proceeds from that helped us establish the museum. But yeah, when the roof went bad, we thought, you know, that was $17,000. <laughs> and we thought, yeah. oh my gosh, I don't think I can sell that many clothespin designs. <laughs> yeah, it's just, a lot of clothespin dolls. <laughs> yeah, and then the 32,000, I thought, oh boy, yeah, that's too much. We still do make clothespin dolls, though. We love doing it. It's just a supplemental hobby of ours. And we even have a small building that we got from Home Depot on the premises that we call the Clothespin Museum. <laughs> okay, yeah. Do you make uh, any officer clothespin dolls? I do. I, okay. I, I made some MHS officers. We have a diorama of you know showing the whole history from uh, uh from the early explorers the, the chinook indians that fished there up to the um, lewis and clark and the donation land claim and the cannery and the fishing yeah. camp yeah so absolutely yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have covered the territory <laughs> yeah no i i'm sure i know i would like a doll and i'm sure anybody who's watching this would want to get their hands on a doll like that if it's if it's phs people like the the phs history trinkets so <laughs> well i don't know but anyway <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we do have a clothespin website in case you're interested <laughs> our daughter does a lot of history with our clothespin dolls on our website uh, that's a separate one yeah okay but uh but let's see we have um uh pretty much you know especially we have one one of our uh, board members is doing a lot of research um, and we've established the ships coming from all over the world um, oh. and it's interesting because when this opened in 1899 um, there was no Panama Canal and there were ships from Germany mm. uh, Britain wow. uh, let's see, Norway France I mean it was kind of amazing they were coming around the horn so we were getting yeah. And it was that lumber and canned salmon and uh, hay, hay, let's see, um, wheat. Uh, Oregon and uh, Eastern Oregon and Washington are big wheat producers, and that was in great demand. Uh, and apples. So those things were going out. And okay. incoming then, uh, a lot of, uh, well, we also had, let's see, Australia, uh, China, Japan, Peru. Yep. Russia, uh, all of those we were getting, but certainly from coming from the Orient, uh, we were getting Asian goods. And I think one of the funniest things that I <laughs> we ran across recently that one of the imports that was quite popular from China and Japan were goldfish. <laughs> and you could buy goldfish a dozen for 50 cents. Hmm. Now, evidently, that was some kind of a draw for people, <laughs> um, these exotic little goldfish. And I thought, yeah. I never had heard that before. But of course, we were also importing a lot of laborers. We were getting a lot of Asians um, yeah. um, manning, um, working in the fish canneries. Yeah. Um, there was a hierarchy. Uh, they were not they were not allowed to be citizens. There was a lot of discrimination, uh, but those they were hard workers. Um, they supplied the um, uh, the the, um, the canneries with cheap labor, uh, but they sent the money home. Uh, most of them, I think, probably returned to China. We're trying to do some research on that Chinese history right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, by the time the uh, quarantine station was built, we had passed two Chinese exclusion acts. So. Uh, only only no more laborers. Well, no, we don't want them anymore because we Americans need those jobs. You know, it's that old discrimination thing that fall, and we don't want yeah. and they were they were cheap labor. We were getting more immigrants with, with cheap yeah. cheaper labor too. So all of that uh, falls into this. Uh, but the, but it all comes down to all of these stations being very aware that infectious disease 
was something we wanted to keep out of the United States. Yeah. Um, it's am it's amazing that we've had such a replay with this COVID thing this year. But exactly, yeah. Of course, the flu epidemic in the 1918-19, and that time, that was another mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And people have forgotten that we wore masks back then too. <laughs> yeah, it's easy easy to forget these yeah. these things that happen. So. Yeah. And, and of course, we have made uh, great strides uh, with a controlling of disease, st but obviously that's never going to end. We will yeah. always have some kind of fear of something developing, yeah. and we better get used to it. But in exactly. those days, it was cholera, malaria, and smallpox, and yellow fever was another one, and yeah. typhus. Um, and of course, the saying was, where ships go, so goes the plague. Yep. There had been a resurgence of plague in, night, in around 1900, 1890s to 1900 in there, um, in both Hong Kong and Honolulu. And yep. there were flags, you know, going up all over saying, be aware, you people on the West Coast, you're getting a lot of travel, travel uh, ships arriving from the Orient. And mm -hmm. you need to fumigate those ships. You need to get those people, you know, tested, make sure. That yep. nobody's got the plague. Yep. So that was um, in San Francisco. Um, it got an awful lot of that, <clears throat> and they um, they kind of <laughs> well, there's some sort of stories involving the, the Marine Hospital Service back then. Yeah. Um, a little bit of cover up going on. Yeah. Uh, because everybody was scared of the spills of the plague, and who wouldn't be? Uh, not a pleasant way to die, and um, they didn't want the word to get out that we were doing, you know, really doing that. We're controlling this. And, and I think they even had, they even served a dinner for diplomats and politicians, most likely on the streets of San Francisco to, outside to make sure that people realized that it was very safe. <laughs> yep. Never mind, but we're in the meantime, we're keeping all those Chinese separate from us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's an interesting story in a book that if you're interested in, um, that I'm sure your PHS colleagues have talked about or um, know about, which is called Surgeon General's Warning. And it's, so it's a, that's the title, Surgeon General's Warning, I'm uh, forgetting the author, but they talk about that, uh, that cover-up story uh, because Walter Wyman was the Surgeon General at the right. time. And he, there was, um, he had done a lot of good work, but they kind of talk about that was a big blemish in his career because there was that cover up going on and the mistreatment of the Asian community in San Francisco um, due, to, yeah. due to the scare of plague. Um, so it's a, it, it's a pretty interesting story. And again, just kind of makes you think about our times now with you know, immigration at the border, COVID, um, how all these things are at play when, when these problems are going on. So it's, it's really interesting. I recommend that. Definitely. Oh, I will ask my my two guys. I'll see if they yeah yeah they must have that yeah. So they um so um just to kind of provide more context for people that are listening a little bit later to bring it to the importance of the quarantine station in Napton in uh so in 1891 they had there was a federal law that mandated health inspections of immigrants um and the public health service physicians were were set to do that and then it. In 1893, there was even a stronger order from uh, President Harrison at the time, and he directed Surgeon General Wyman to, to really strengthen our laws in 1893. And that's when he, Walter Wyman said, every single ship that comes in has to be inspected by a yeah. federal officer. Um, and so that's when, you know, these, a lot of these stations were popping up and that's when you know, and, and a story I think they've been had been clamoring for one for some time, and they finally got it in. Uh, was it 1899? You said or 1899? Yeah, it actually it opened in 1899. Yeah, they finally. Okay. Uh, one of our board members is a history professor at Portland State has just written about that early building up to that. Uh, he's got mm -hmm. a book out now. It's on our website, I think. But oh, yep. a whole lot of whole lot of political maneuvering uh, in order to get a quarantine station here. And then they, <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, furor really going on because I said, come on, you guys, you know, you've got Seattle, we have uh, Diamond Point, which is feeding into the Seattle area. 
in, in San Francisco and there's nothing in between big enough to take care of these. It took a lot of persuasion and finagling and a lot of, <laughs> yeah. a lot of investigating for sites and all that stuff, but ultimately it did. And it was interesting, let's see, by, by 1921, uh, <clears throat> there was, and I, this is in my book, I think too, uh, the, uh, uh, quite a, a whole big full page article on the quarantine station and how great it was doing. And it said, mm -hmm. because of the enormous increase in shipping on the Columbia River, um, there, the quarantine station there has kept disease from in, entering the Columbia River. Yes. And mm -hmm. that they said the Columbia River quarantine station is ranked in the top 10. Yeah. I thought, really? <laughs> Yeah, I, I I remember that part of the book, um, and I wanted to ask um, what so because because to me it gave me a sense of you know they were they were really proud of having that um, and that that it was doing well. Mm -hmm. What do we know about what the reputation was with of the quarantine station in Astoria in Napton? Like how was it received by the community? Do we know anything about that? Well, yes, we're finding this is another one of our researchers. This gal is just doing a terrific job. She has gone back and looked at the newspapers from that time. We do have a log that was kept at the station, but it didn't, it, it just fluffed over the first few years. It didn't really start till 1906. So we're trying to okay. fill that void. And boy, are we finding some interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> The, as they were the uh, public, the commissioned officers. Okay. The, they lived. They all lived in Astoria in quite nice mm. homes. Okay. Uh, they were kind of the higher echelon. They were society, and they were always giving parties for. It. And it's several, several times it said that uh, yes, that Bayless Earl gave a party, and uh, they wanted took quite a, a number of people, twenty couples, to trip the light. Fantastic. And, and, they, and anybody who's listening, <laughs> Bayless, Bayless Earl, is, oh, he was the first, the first or, or the second or um, assistant yeah, surgeon, one yeah. of the first couple that established the, the first one that was there for any length of time. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so they were entertaining, which it, you, know, <laughs> it, you kind of think, well, you know, all the mice are away, the, the cats will play while the mice are away. <laughs> No, it's the other way around, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> we were pretty remote out here. And we we have one picture of uh, one of the Oli Estes, who was, he was not a commissioned officer, but he was a caretaker. He was a, a young Norwegian carpenter hired early on and was there for quite some time. But there's a picture we have of him holding two nice big salmon. I think that's in the book too, isn't it? Well, evidently there was a little, a little bit of hanky panky going on. Some, you know, there was, there was a lot of activity when a ship came in. But in between times, they're over there, six miles across the river, mm -hmm. a little bit bored. Maybe you know they do, they clean up and do what they can. But maybe there's a little time for some fishing on the side. Oh yeah, <laughs> you got it. All... If you're in a place like that with the salmon up. <laughs> I would well, right out, right out in front there, you know, and yeah. who knows? Maybe they were even selling some. You know, it's hard to say what was going on, but yeah. um, they um, certainly took advantage of that. And there are um, innumerable instances in all of this early re uh, research that's not in my book that this gal is doing. That a lot of times they would get a um, a whole group of people to go over for a picnic over at the quarantine station. Now the rules were, <laughs> there were supposed to be no women or families on the station, hmm. but evidently um, they sort of skirted over that. And it it's a beautiful location. It had a lovely little beach there and a nice house for a party. So I guess there was a lot of, <laughs> so the people, uh, of Astoria really catered to the um, to the commissioned officers and their wives and families. Yeah. Uh, now, let's see, was it 1805? Is that right? Was that was the um, Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland? And that was when Walter Wyman actually came out here. And it, the reason the draw was the exposition, the big exposition in Portland. But he came to Astoria and there are newspaper accounts of boy, they rolled out the red carpet and they did notify 
Ole and the rest of the guys over at the station, you better get that place shaped up. We, there are letters oh, yeah. that are saying, you, know, you need to have them line up and answer the <laughs> muster call. Yeah, don't mess around. Yeah. <laughs> need to act like we know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, so, no, go ahead. Was... Well, that, so we, we know that there was a good relationship. Uh, okay. maybe, maybe better than there should have been. But anyway, yeah. 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 You brought up uh, a, another thing I wanted to to um, ask about, um, which is you know, so the, these ships were coming in. They were they were um, they essentially. My understanding is they would stop in at Astoria if they would be inspected. If if there's an issue, they'd be sent north to the cove. And so, right. so how often was that happening? And you know, so you mentioned that the officers. You know, if there's not a ship, what, you know, so I'm curious what were what was kind of like the the life like of an officer, and then um, what was the process that they went through if a, if they did have to go inspect a ship? Well, as I and or understand it, every ship from a foreign port or even from an American port, if they'd come around the Horn, if they if they had left the United States, every ship was boarded by okay. the head position, the commissioned officer who inspected that ship. Okay. Now, by that time. Um, you know that the uh, the the law went into effect uh, in 1891 to, that all these ships had to be inspected. Well, this is almost a decade later, mm -hmm. and the word got out very quickly around the world. If you if you're taking a ship into the port, any of these ports, you darn well better get your ship cleaned up, and we don't want any sickness aboard. Mm -hmm. So the United States actually uh, in, uh, installed inspection sites at ports of departure. Um, there uh, in Germany, there was a, there quite a, quite a lot of that that went on. And our 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 German immigrant that's on our board, the, the professor, he's kind of a kick. He he um he goes back and forth to Berlin all the time because he's got a girlfriend there. But he's um he has done a lot of research from that end, and uh, we even have pictures that look almost identical to what we have in in our lazaretto. The same light fixtures, the same. The same setups that they had back there, the shower stalls, the things that are being set up. So that began to clean things up. Part of the reason, of course, was monetary. Uh, the owners of the ships had to pay for the fumigation. It mm. delayed their cargo 48 hours, if not longer. Mm. Um, and they had to pay the return passage of anybody who didn't make it in the gate. So they are saying, ship captains, clean up your ships. You know, save your, save the taxpayers' money, yeah. save your, save your owners' money, and incidentally, you might save a few lives. I mean, what a good idea! <laughs> right, that's fascinating. That that reminds me too. Um, if for Ellis Island, I remember reading about um, they would, they, when they were inspected at Ellis Island, if somebody had an issue uh, or health issue, they would be sent back. And they eventually, there was so much heartbreak and to be denied at the border like that. So they, the public health service eventually started sending officers to the embassy at those countries to, to kind of preemptively screen people so they didn't get all the way to the U.S. and then be turned back. So that kind of reminds me of, of That's that. That's interesting. Yeah, that sure stands to reason. Um, yeah. And of course, um, later on in the, in the we of course we've instigated quotas and that cut down a lot. And of course, World War One intervenes in there and that cut down on a lot of the certainly immigration. So mm. there were a lot of factors that led into it. And um, okay. but but initially, according to this, um, and you, you probably know this, a ship has to have um, after a health inspection. They they if they are ordered pratique. That's the word they use, and there's a certificate. Of, that if you have a certificate of critique, you can proceed on. So if your ship is clean, you don't have to go over to be fumigated. But there's, you know, they're looking for rats on board. They're looking for anybody green around the gills. You know, yeah. uh, so and look too good. Um, you're going to be sent over on the Columbia River or other places to the fumigation to be fumigated. Hmm. So it it. A lot. So I would say that that's another thing we we don't know for sure how many ships actually had to be fumigated. We're trying to figure that out. Okay. How many were granted pratique at the mouth of the river mm -hmm. and then could proceed or or had to be fumigated. 
we can pretty much tell from 1906 because we have the log for that, but we're trying to do these, these early ones too. Yeah. But, but, but really the, the public health service is pretty much credited with keeping disease at bay. They really, in, in the United States, they've been part, they performed a very important function. And certainly for the times um, uh, before we had answers, scientific solutions to a lot of these disease problems, mm -hmm. um, that was a, it was an important thing. It really was important. It helped keep things fairly infection free. Oh yeah. So what do we know about, um, so that the officers would go um, to, you know, inspect ships. Um, and I, I wanted to bring up the, um, the boats that they use, the steamers. Were, the, were those, um, what was the process with that? Were those public health service steamers or what was the process? Well, you know, the, at first I think they wanted to have a lot of money to build one, but I, I don't think, that, but that didn't, they, they ended up um, kind of renting ones. Okay. Um, there was one called, um, there've been several. Uh, about four of them that I can think of, the Donald Curry, the Electric, um, and the, the Electro, okay. um, the one there's a picture of. Well, we have two pictures, I think, of those, but mm -hmm. uh, they were um, a sort of leased by the government. Okay. And on, I know on the Electro, the Babbage family, they were a family in Astoria that did shipping oh. and built boats. Uh, Captain Babbage appears to be wearing a PHS uniform. So maybe he, uh, we don't, I don't, I, that's another thing we can probably find out more about, but okay. certainly you see, we have one picture of the electro and you can see the commissioned officers or not, not all commissioned officers, the, the commissioned officers and also the public health service employees yes. that were uniformed that are standing on that, you can see them on that boat ready to um, go to either across the river or uh, to go inspect a boat mm -hmm. or ship. Mm -hmm. So there were a succession of, of um, I, yeah, I noticed on your website, that interesting website that you have, you are kind of looking at those little, those little shuttle boats really. Yeah, there, there was um, various tugboats that were, um, that the public health service owned for um, various stations. Um, one was called, it was named after Walter Wyman. There was a tugboat. I don't know which oh. one that was. Um, and I can't remember of the ones that I wrote about, there is one still that is that remains yeah. in a that visual condition. Um, that would be cool. Yeah, so yeah. I know that was a piece of public health history that, you know, not these in, in these days of the public health service, um, I think a lot of officers would acknowledge and would long for more of uh, resources like that dedicated to PHS. Um, and I think it's really cool to look back and see, oh, wow, like we really had more of these resources to, to carry out these functions for the, for the mission at hand. So um, I, I think it's interesting to, to look back at some of those things. Well, those uh, certainly at the, um, the Napton Co facility, uh, those, those little, shuttle boats really was what they were really important because that was the only access from Astoria where the main offices were and where the officers lived mm -hmm. to get across the river so I think they had to make at least a weekly tour over there to make you know even if a ship wasn't in there to check things out but uh, okay. those those little boats were uh, of great importance they they were and I think something that people overlook um when you look at these uh, the stations, uh, they had to have a good water system. Uh, you know, uh, anytime you have a hospital, uh, you've got to have laundry facilities. Uh, you, you had all those um, showers and things out on the dock. They had to pipe that water out that, see that, that long, long gangway? Yep. It was as long as a football field. That water wow. was piped out there to the bathrooms that were out on the dock because before you set foot on American soil. When you got off your ship, if it were sent for fumigation, you stripped and went through health inspection and showered before you could, you had to pass health inspection before they'd let you go up there on shore. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so they did all that before actually getting right? on, onto yeah. land. Okay. All of your, all of your wow. uh, luggage and um, uh, your clothing, all your personal belongings, uh, if you can look at that building, the 
Let's see. Can I point to it? I yeah, don't know. Yeah. Let's see. I, this is just a picture I have behind me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Where am I here? Okay. This part. Yep. Th that was the fumigation area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I well, there's two parts of that building, and one part where the showers and all the health inspection went in place, and the other part, the west end, that was where there were these big um, tanks. Uh, that was where all your uh, clothing and, and luggage was fumigated. It went through big delousing retorts, they called them. It appears that they may have recycled those from the fish cannery because the, they used those big oh, wow. retorts canning fish and, and uh, that dry heat was used to fumigate the clothing. But there, oh, wow. there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into the and into even a very small station like this, just the, just the upkeep all the time, you know, getting all water to people uh, they did generate their own electricity um, they must have had some power outages because in the building itself uh the we do the, the original light fixtures you know they're just oh wow a ring with a light <laughs> yeah that, no fancy um, chandeliers or anything no in fact one of our one of the main wards the only place we have any electrical outlets or places my dad jerry rigged to stick in there <laughs> The night it's kind of an electrician's nightmare and yes. plumbing nightmare. <laughs> it's pretty old, you know, but it works. It. Yep. But um, there are hooks on the ceiling that evidently were for holding lanterns in case the generator wasn't working. But okay. Yeah, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. So you can see why they had to have people at that station all the time for maintenance. So yeah, I was just going to ask that next question. So if the officers were in Astoria, kind of right. waiting for ships, more or less, um, yeah. were there groundskeepers or maintenance people over there? Or was there an officer oh. over there all the time? How did that work? Apparently, no officers there all the time. Okay. But this Ole Estes had a crew of, of people. There was a, a, a family that his the wife did the cooking and he did maintenance work. Um, um, there were people that lived near near the station the little town of napton the mill town was just really a quarter of a mile up river there was a boardwalk that went between the two so it wasn't okay. very far you could walk to work yeah uh, there were <laughs> um and, and and napton had schools and a post office and okay uh, you know all hotels and i mean it was a, a thriving little town so people could live uh, uh, up there um, there was one instance later on of, of the Behrman family that uh, Charles Behrman was hired. And this was kind of, I think, when things were tapering off a bit, maybe in the late 18 and the 1930s. Okay. But he, he moved his family into the cannery superintendent's house. That's the big house down by the water there, which is still there. Okay. That, that was a no-no. You were not supposed to have your family living there. And the word got out that, yeah, you know, Charlie Behrman, well, yeah. So anyway, he, he ended up bu building a house very adjacent to the station. And I'm, you have to laugh because you, you think maybe those kids might have played on the station grounds and come on. <laughs> right. And there was one family, a Norwegian fishing family that lived to the just west of the station. And um, the old fisherman that I knew that lived there, Harold Haygrup, he was the son of the uh, original builder of that place. Um, I said, well, Harold, how did you get to school? Because they went to school up at Napton. Okay. How did you get to school? You know, when the, when there was a ship in there and there were, you know, people running around, you aren't supposed to go on the premises. <laughs> they, he said, oh, hell, he said, we just walked on the beach. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> they must have, you know, kept six foot distance from everybody. <laughs> anyway. I mean, this is a pretty, this is a pretty isolated area, even now, right? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty out there. I mean, as far as being well, yeah. rural goes, there is a, there is a, 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 a highway, you know, that connects um, to uh, 101 is the, mm. the post highway. And it's, it's an, if it's 401, it's an offshoot that goes about 12 miles to the other main highway yeah it is still kind of although i'm surprised how much traffic there is now <laughs> yeah yeah but, so we can yeah. just imagine back then i mean yeah. there are the rules and stuff but i'm sure there was room who's for gonna know wiggling. exactly <laughs> so yeah for better or for worse 
but but apparently despite despite all that that's just human behavior going on i think they were pretty serious about maintaining and doing a, a good job when they were expected to perform you know when they had something they had to deal with um they would they would do it yeah so what do we know about um the you know kind of the structure of of workers there so there was an assistant surgeon was he overseeing the I, I, in your book you you show the different chevrons of of the workers was there a certain yeah. demand structure or or a way of working that we know about well we don't exactly know i think uh, Thad Trellinger, he's the one, he was an engineer. I, I, we know that. Some of them, uh, uh, you know, there was, they had one for fumigation. Yeah. We don't know exactly which ones were appointed to do what. We, that, that information is probably somewhere in the archives. That would be interesting to know. But yeah. uh, we got though, that information from um, one of your books um, that was given to us about uh, protocol. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, you probably have that one. I think we're. I think I, it's I, one of the the manuals it's kind, for. It's kind of a little manual, yeah, and it has. Uh, and we just sort of, for the book, we just plucked out the ones that would have been appropriate for that for this small station. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think um, boat swing was one, and that must have. Been, that's what we think. Um, Babbage that he must have been appointed that. So that oh, that okay. he was the one. Uh, who shuttled the boat back and forth yeah oh so i we kind of assume that but um it's not really recorded in any records that we have found yes okay it's still so much to discover i you know it just never it's kind of fun it never oh, ends yeah. Nothing's I, I mean, always it, it sounded like this whole story um you know you guys came across like oh oh this is a lazaretto what is what's a lazaretto oh it's a pest house and then it just keeps on going it does uh down the rabbit hole so to speak so uh it's fascinating yeah history can be very entertaining to certain people can it <laughs> I, I oh, mean, yeah. Yeah, there, there are there are quite a few of us <laughs> and we may be a different breed but but we sure find it fascinating and oh, we yeah. do think really important to, to preserve this art <clears throat> one of our main concerns now <clears throat> Well, my age, for starters, um, that uh, looking to the future, what what are we going to do with this? Mm. And we're we would really like to strengthen our ties with the public health service. Maybe somebody will have a good idea. Um, mm. Okay. We're we're trying to you know it's very small. Uh, it's it's too small uh, for the National Park Service to take any interest in. And when you're trying to shift it to somebody, the first thing they say is, do you have an endowment? Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're, we <laughs> are pretty good at making operating expenses and doing a few extra things. Yeah. Um, but we certainly don't have an endowment. Yeah. Um, but um, anyway, we think it's, <clears throat> we, I'm sure there would be some kind of a solution. Um, uh, there's there's one possibility that the National Park Service, which also <clears throat> oversees the public, uh, the National Park uh, Public Health Service, is part of the National Park Service because they maintain all the health necessities at the national park. So there is a connection, yeah. and they have they have done a few things for us. They've made us a sign. Um, they they've okay. been very supportive, but there's there's a designation that's pretty ambiguous, and I I don't know. We're, we're thinking we might try to go for it. Maybe you can, maybe your people will help us. Um, it's the National Park Service has something called an affiliate. Okay. They, which means they do not take ownership. Uh, they don't want to own it because it's a pain. Okay. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but they help somehow technically and financially. But in order to get that designation, you must have congressional approval. Hmm. And the also, that involves the Department of the Interior. That's why <laughs> we're interested okay. in our new um, director. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. all coming together. <laughs> um, so you have to, I guess, cozy up to your legislators. It has, anyway. Um, no, it, I'm glad you brought this up. This is, uh, I'm glad you brought this up because um, I think anybody who's listening or watching this later on will perk their ears up and be interested in this 
And I'm just thinking out loud, you know, we have organizations that, that do um, uh, fight, so to speak, for officers' um, uh, issues for us on Capitol Hill. Um, oh. and, and they are very interested uh, in preserving PHS history. So I've, I'm looking forward to, to bringing up conversation about this to that organization, so. That would yeah. be terrific. If that's all that comes out of this, this would be great. <laughs> I, you know, I have several times invited a Surgeon General to come. I can't seem to get one out here. I thought for sure I could get one in, 2000, uh, in 1905 because Walter Wyman had, we've had one, Walter okay. Wyman. He's the, okay. only, he's the only one that's oh. ever come. And I'm, I think it's overdue. I'll send a message to the Surgeon General on on Twitter and social media. Oh, and I'm impressed with Murthy. You know, he's oh, he's he was highly thought of out here on the West Coast by the uh, commission officers that I know. They said he is really a good guy. I'm happy that he's taken the helm. Mm -hmm. And we would be oh so happy. We'd even let him spend a night in the pest house if he wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, I'd love to do that. I wanted to. I wanted to ask you this, um, just going back to your book, uh, can you describe where the term pest house, guest house came from? <laughs> well, out of desperation, we did <laughs> actually rent out the West portion <laughs> for several years because before we got nonprofit status, we had to pay property taxes. Yep. And of course, my mom, uh, I won't get it too much. We had to just subdivide the property. So yeah. Unfortunately, when you subdivide a piece of property, they come and look at it and say, oh, we're going to make your taxes more. You know, their taxes yep. were practically nil when my mom and dad. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yep. Oh, surprise, surprise. So, and so the clothespin things helped. We sold clothespins and that helped pay for it. And of course, you got to, you know, you got to pay for the electricity or, you know, or a few things. Yep. And the, um, the, where was I going with this? Help me. <laughs> oh, just uh, the how the origins of Pest House Guest House and oh, and... oh, well, that was that was Heather's, our daughter. Yeah. So we we actually rented it to a um, summer in the summer to a an employee from the park district from National Parks because um, Fort Clatsop is right across the river from us. So they rented it for several years. So Heather said, "Well, we just call it Pest House Guest House." Yep. And we had tried renting it to just on our own to the family. It, it, it's pretty fragile. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're talking ele electric and plumbing that was installed in 1899 or yeah. actually 1912. It's much more modern, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's over a hundred years old. You know, we, we finally were so relieved when we didn't have to rent it out anymore. We call it it's it's our we that side of the building we we call that board our hospitality room. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's still it still can be the pest house guest house. <laughs> yeah, no, I I, I laughed when I when I read that. I I thought that was clever, so I wanted people to know about that. <laughs> only only special people though. Now the things people who can understand old plumbing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Well, this has been really good. And I just wanted to ask kind of another question just to kind of close things out. Um, given your, you know, you've learned a lot about this site and it has so much history when it, when it comes to public health and, and pandemics. Now that we're in 2021, you know, how do you think about the public health service now in light of COVID and just kind of looking back in history, you know, are there any things where that, that come to mind about, oh, geez, you know, maybe we didn't, maybe we're not doing what we did back in the day or anything come to mind for you? Uh, well, certainly history, we can learn from it. And my feeling is that, uh, especially now, I wasn't too impressed with the last administration and the, uh, but I, and this, I didn't think that Surgeon General did what he should have done. Mm -hmm. uh, but I said, I'm encouraged with this. Murthy knows what he's doing. Um, I, I really think it's a great, a great opportunity for the public health service to kind of reemerge as an important part of uh, what we do in this country. I, I think people are not aware of all that the public health service has done and still continues to do. It's a pretty, it's pretty quiet. It's, you know, nobody talks about it too much. And I think it's time to come out of your cocoon and mm -hmm. make it known. Um, 
and spread the word about some of these really good projects. I know um, one of our volunteers and he was a young man with the service. Uh, it, he did a whole lot down with the Ebola project, you know, yep. and that was down at the border with all those unsupervised kids down yep. there. And he was Hispanic and he was able to speak the language. And yep. uh, we have another another one that for a while that were, uh, was on our board that was uh, Indian Health Services and he was yep. himself a, a tribal person. So uh, I, yep. I think all of that stuff is good PR. Yeah. Educational for people, they need to know that the good things that the public health service continues to do. Yeah, I agree. And um, one, th there are a lot of good things um, in the present day, and in some ways, I think it might be to our detriment. In that, um, versus this quarantine station and in that mm -hmm. period of history, there is a very direct, singular focus about what the public health service was doing. So, like. There was barely any people there, but everybody knew probably in Astoria, like, oh yeah, the public health service is there that they they yeah. take care of the the ships coming in, like their focus and mission is mm -hmm. quarantining quarantining people and preventing disease from coming in. I think nowadays we're we're doing a lot of good things, but it's so diluted and so spread out that it that it, sometimes it's hard to to define. Okay, well, what? So you, okay, you help with Native American health, you help at the border, but like it's so it's not singular right it's not a direct thing that, you're right so i th i think even i think even if public health service was smaller like it was back in the day and had a singular mission and focus that might be more uh uh known in the public consciousness than than it is today with more people uh you know i think people might disagree with that but um just well, that's interesting. I, I think you have a good point. Uh, it, you dilute things too much, you kind of lose focus on what the main purpose all, originally was to prevent disease, infectious disease from entering the country mm -hmm. and spreading. Right. And certainly after this COVID thing we've all been through, the public is now fully aware that that is one really important aspect <laughs> of yep. living on this planet. Yep. We, we, yeah, exactly. We, we kind of forgot about it and then yeah. you just get smacked in the face with, with a virus or bacteria or whatever it is. So, by the way, my, my husband and I have both had both our shots. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I just got finished mine a couple of weeks ago. So I'm very happy with that. So, good feeling. Yeah. So Nancy, this has been really great. Um, of course, I'm going to recommend people uh, get this book. It's oh, yeah. <laughs> quick and easy to uh, to uh, read, um, not long at all. And then Nancy, if people want to find more about find out more about the quarantine station in your book, uh, where can they find you? Well, our website, NaptonCoveHeritageCenter.org. and our Perfect. you can order the book through us on the website too. So Perfect. And, and I'll, I'll include that in, in uh, the description of this interview and people can find that, those links and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you. So Nancy, thanks again. Um, I'm sure we'll be in touch. And again, I think you, you've, um, you know, looking to see what the next step is for this Heritage Center. I hope that um, people who watch this might have some ideas. And I know um, I already have an idea of kind of uh, to, to pitch this idea to people and see how we can preserve it going forward or help out, you know, so. Um, Good. And I hope you'll get to visit someday. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to bring my wife there. I think she would <laughs> she'd like to do that. And I drag her along every time we when we're traveling. I'm always looking for public health service uh, stuff in the in the city that we're at. And I'll just say, oh, we got to go check this out quick. So <laughs> Absolutely. It'd, it'd be great. So you'd be most welcome. All right, Nancy. Well, thanks so much. Um, and uh, it, it's been a great conversation.